medical program. Two ounces every day for their medical program. We allow units. The units get very complicated when patients start buying flour versus edible versus concentrate. And more patients are moving into the alternative forms because not everyone wants to smoke. So you've got to give them that independence with their caregiver. Patients know best how to treat themselves. Arizona has a straight traditional measurement, but it's not two ounces per day, which Colorado is generous. I don't think it's overly generous. It is generous. Arizona has allowed two and a half ounces every 14 days or five ounces per month, period. There is no unit calculation. We don't penalize you for concentrate, and we don't penalize you for edibles. It's that simple. And there is no problem with the limits in Arizona. Nevada basically, again, imitated something that worked. They allowed two and a half ounces every 14 days, five ounces a month. So we want to convert New Mexico to a like kind of, see how they measure against other states. If we take the magical 230 unit number and we convert it into grams of flour, assuming every patient just bought flour, that means in that center column, patients could buy essentially 2.7 grams, I'm sorry, 2.7 ounces of flour a month. I said 2.7 ounces of flour per month. New Mexico, Arizona, five ounces, nearly twice. Nevada, five ounces, nearly twice. Colorado, you could buy 60 ounces. We only trust our patients with flour of 2.7. It gets a lot worse for our high pain threshold patients. High pain threshold patients because they need quality concentrate in the highest purity possible. We'll talk about the threshold of 70% separately. But let's just talk about concentrate. In Colorado, using their threshold, if a patient just wanted milligrams of concentrate, they could buy 56,643 milligrams per day. In Arizona and Nevada, they could buy 6,057 milligrams per day. In New Mexico, if you want to be compliant, you would be allowed a maximum of 500 milligrams. That's a 500 milligram like a single Tylenol. Okay? That's real science. That's real math. That's real calculation. It's trying to make these numbers real. I challenge anyone to check the numbers, verify them. This is not trying to embarrass someone. This is just trying to emphasize what the truth really is. We're not even going to talk about the far column to the right because I think it would take too long, but I can assure you the same problem occurs on medicals. But the reality is patients just don't buy flour, they just don't buy concentrates, they just don't buy medicals, they buy a mix. And they want more of some things they're not allowed to have because of the limits and the plant count. Last page I'd like to share with you is our recommendation of what we think should be considered by the committee, either in legislation or by the department, in regulation. I think we have that list passed out, please. Um, you know, we're just running so short of time. We still have three other presenters and questions. I can have them real quick. All right, 10 items. We don't allow patients to have discounts right now if they buy more than a, a gram. Discounts should be allowed to patients for cost savings. Product limit should be raised to no less than five ounces per month per patient. Remove the artificial concentration limit of 70%. No fee for replacement or, a replacement or lost cards. Renewal of cards every three years. Presumptive eligibility. You're, you're basically approved until you're proven otherwise. Other recommendations? Plant count removal. Uh, amendment to dispensaries be processed quickly. Removal of gross receipts tax on the sales to patients for cannabis and reciprocity. New Mexico should respect and honor programs from other states. Those are the ten recommendations. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Ford. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you very much for having me today. 
Uh, there are a lot of things that I disagree with. There are a lot of things that I agree with very strongly. Uh, I'm going to start with the things that I agree with because there are a lot of angry patients behind me. Uh, the number one issue I think that we're facing is this, is this restriction on patient access to medicine. 230 units is not enough for any patient. Uh, when you start taking in the different methods of ingestions, uh, I think that you'll find that uh, the, the spirit of the law will be a theme uh, uh, that I want to touch on a number of times. The spirit of the law was specifically um, that the patient had the right to possess enough cannabis that they had an uninterrupted supply for 90 days. Uh, it seems to me that the Department of Health and the Medical Cannabis Program has taken those uh, numbers and kind of jumbled them to make some sort of strange limitation. Uh, a patient has a legislative right to possess enough cannabis to guarantee them the, the 90 days of, of, of uninterrupted supply. Uh, if you go back and you read the act, I think it's, it's very clear, and I don't understand why the, the program has, has changed it to be more restrictive. Uh, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is William Ford. I'm the managing director of Reynolds Greenleaf and Associates. We uh, are a cannabis industry consultancy. Uh, we're located here in New Mexico. One of the nice benefits that's come out of the uh, Linux Air Compassionate Use Act is that a lot of people in New Mexico have made cannabis their business. And, and uh, we are an organization that has taken our expertise that we have garnered in New Mexico uh, and we've gone out uh, across the country and applied it to a number of different states. Uh, we have uh, uh, interest in uh, Vermont and Maryland in New Mexico. Uh, we are currently uh, working in uh, Illinois and New York uh, and, and Minnesota. Uh, and that's only just to give you a sense for the fact that, uh, you know, when, when I look at the New Mexico program, I have a lot of context. Uh, and Mr. Rodriguez uh, spoke to uh, comparing New Mexico to other states, and I think that's a fair uh, way to look at it and to, to measure the program. Uh, one of the things I disagree about is the is the uh, growing pains. Uh, I've been in this industry here in New Mexico since 2010, uh, approved in 2011, and operational since then. Uh, we've seen a lot of different iterations of the medical cannabis program, and finally we have one that is somewhat stable and somewhat able to uh, deal with problems in a productive and in a partnership with, with the LME. Uh, our, our organization represents five licensees in New Mexico, uh, and we have had a very positive uh, inter interaction with the department. Uh, I think that uh, there, with anything, with the, with the, with the rise of this program uh, at the speed at which it has uh, risen, uh, you have challenges. Uh, we've struggled as LNDPs to meet the needs of patients, uh, and I think that, that, that the department has too. Uh, to give uh, uh, the benefit of the doubt to the department at this point, uh, when I see the secretary uh, making a grace period for patients, I see that as, uh, as a sign, uh, and, and a good sign, that, that things are positive. Uh, we are serving more patients right now than we've ever served before, and we're doing it in a manner uh, that provides clean, tested material in a safe access uh, the regulation is not perfect, obviously, uh, but it is uh, a partnership. What's missing right now is, is a, uh, a very crucial component to any regulatory body, and that is a committee that brings in experts from the field, brings in people from all the different <coughs> stakeholders in the industry, and discusses the problems and comes up with good solutions. Uh, that is something that I, I feel uh, is probably the most important thing right now uh, that's missing. Uh, secondarily, uh, the idea that multiple sclerosis is going to go away is absurd. The idea that 
that somebody needs to recertify that they have MS is, is again, it's absurd. It, it's, it's a, and in fact, it's, it's rather disrespectful. And this applies to a lot of the different conditions. The idea that a, a patient in New Mexico has to recertify every year is a significant error in the act. Uh, and it should be, it should be addressed. Uh, and expense. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, out of respect for the patients who have traveled here today to have their voices heard, I'm going to cut myself short. Uh, I, want to, I want to say uh, one more thing, which is that uh, New Mexico Department of Health and the Medical Cannabis Program and the LMP and everybody involved in this industry has a responsibility. And the onus is on us as a group to provide for patients, whether they are in Albuquerque, whether they're in Santa Fe, Taos, or the Boot Hill, we have a responsibility to get medicine to them. I would call on the, on the Department of Health and the Medical Cannabis Program uh, to consider subsidizing a delivery system. Uh, so, uh, subsidizing existing delivery systems or creating incentives for groups to reach out to rural patients. These are the folks who are suffering the most and who have the least access to the medicine. And it's something that hasn't been mentioned today, and it is very important. Uh, well, they have to go through checkpoints in certain parts of the state. That's a really issue. For them. It's a beautiful thing that they only have checkpoints in one direction. It, it can be addressed. Uh, and, and, it, and it can be outwitted, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, I, I, I will uh, um, take any questions that the, the committee may have. Um, I think I think we will go to questions. You know, we had we had one. We, we actually had two people. Uh, Stephanie Bartell, is she here? Yes. Okay. Why don't you come up, and then we'll we'll include you as one of the panelists. Then um, Jason Barker had to leave, but I was pointed out to the committee members that I believe he sent, at least I got, and I, I think all of you got on your emails, uh, a long list of, of documents that he's prepared. He couldn't afford to print them out. I guess he didn't realize he could just get one for our staff and we would print them out. Well, we got one. If he got them to us ahead of time, we could have passed them out. But, uh, in the future, if you have something for the committee and you can't afford to print out a 30 copies of a 50 page document, give it to us and see if the next guy is virtually unlimited. So, so we, we can pass it up that way, yeah. Okay. Um, did you consider the Brad on that point? Did you have a question? Um, good, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, Percocet, 
Vicodin or, or any other impairing or medicines that could possibly be potential to uh, overdose and kill the patient. It's just to do something to maybe move this along until we figure it out. But now that you've heard our call and I offer a plain letter extension to the patients as well as for the providers, I feel that it's too late for some of our friends and family members in the program. Um, my patient, another patient that I care for, I have two patients I care for. Another patient, Garth Wilson, uh, suggested Saturday in an online conversation, and I quote, uh, that to allow patients that are over 50 years old with chronic conditions that are likely only to get worse, not better, have an option for a lifetime card. <clears throat> in correlation to that comment, the conditions on the list are considered lifetime as well, most of them. And cannabis is helping those patients control these symptoms. My second concern are the units provided to each patient, of course. I want to ask you and to address the 230 unit choices as the next top priority. Uh, issues with 203 units, units are killing some of us out there because there's just not enough medicine. A large number of patients are complaining about being able to be <coughs> unable to buy medication because of technical issues with the controlling software, Biotrack. Nobody seems to have any idea what's causing the problems. The Department of Health tells us it's not their problem. Biotrack tells us the same thing. Patients can't obtain an itemized list of when their renewal of their 230 units are. They come in and they, I, they come in to dispensaries and ask when are my units back to 230, and they can't give them any information. Um, they have no clue when the computer tells them to wait five weeks and try again. Dispensaries are unable to give them any insights to wait time as well, like I just said. Many of these patients are buying edibles and other concentrates and are recounting as one unit instead of two tenths of a unit because most of the edibles are 200 milligrams. Um, it seems that the system is just docking it and just almost picking a number out of the air and putting it down for the dosage. Patients are having cards coming in uh, with expiration dates of 2016 that were just issued to the new and their issue date was 2015. Others are coming in with expiration dates of 2018, and their issue date was 2015. Uh, the issue dates for the card should be, of course, 2016 and then 2017, if we're doing it for the yearly thing. My third concern is that there is a shortage of medicine, of course, in this state. Patients are scrambling for their medicine. Lane Goodman declared a medical medicine shortage in February at the last Department of Health meeting. Um, he was completely ignored. Now that we have over 29,000 patients in New Mexico, we cannot stand around idly and ignore the problem that is quickly rising the lack of med with the lack of medicine. I ask that the Department of Health allow the producers to increase their already low plant count to a larger number so that the medicine can be provided to all the patients in New Mexico. With this increase, there'll be more availability of their medicine. Along with the increase of the plant count, there should be a wider availability to more of the rural areas in the state to ensure that all patients are receiving the best care possible. Finally, I'm proposing that now is the time that the MCP have monthly meetings with patient representatives to discuss about patient troubles and woes with the program. More importantly, what is working for the patients and what is not working for the patients. I would like to quote Valerie Hubbard. The LNPPs being over what good working relationships that they have with the Department of Health doesn't meet, and the rest of the good people who run the program. However, don't you think that it's time for the patients to have their chance of being, to shine, to speak, and most importantly, to be heard? Without these patients, there would be no medical cannabis program. And, but that's basically all I'm going to say today. And we, the patients, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So, members, I, I would draw your attention again to Mr. Barker's comments, which were sent to us via email. 
questions. Before we go to public comment, we have committee questions. Thank you, Mr. Porter, for your time and taking your points so succinctly. Uh, Representative, we're lovely to first. Please ask the committee members, in light of the fact that so many people here want to make public comment, if you keep your, your questions to two questions per committee member. And, and, and I know there's lots more information you'd like to get, but maybe uh, after the meeting, you can sit down and get that. So pick your two top questions. And uh, Representative, uh, one or two top questions. Uh, Representative Lewis, we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, uh, during the course of the conversation, my questions were answered. So. Oh, good. Well, good. Maybe uh, Senator McSorley, you get his questions. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Madeline. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, uh, public areas are exempt from state rule. Uh, when, <clears throat> when the legislature ended uh, this past year, uh, I was approached by a prominent uh, individual, a prominent citizen. Uh, from the state here, whether uh, there was any chance you know, for the tribal government to, to grow the medical marijuana. And, uh, that, was, that was me, wasn't it? I asked him. He looked like you, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he everybody looks like yeah, light. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
gradually move along. But for our, what we're looking at really refined, advanced methods of better product. And you know, Mr. Chair, I think uh, the demand needs to really look at that and allow for producers and growers that leeway to be able to really possibly define dosages within our medical marijuana uh, uh, processing and also looking at concentrates and what that entails. And if it means modifying the plant production to certain producers and growers, so we have, but the, with, with, the, with the ultimate uh, uh, view, Mr. Chair, uh, that we're refining, we're advancing the product to the benefit of the patient. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we need to really look at that, Madam Chair, and make appropriate amends, either through policy, uh, rule, regulation, if need be, statute, to really advance our delivery system, our processing system, our product, and, and not just kind of be uh, uh, cracked down because this is what it is and this is what it has to be. You know, Mr. Chair, I think we have growers and producers in our state that are willing to make the investment and, and, and bring in top-notch technology in terms of doing exactly that, in terms of really defining the product itself to levels of dosages, higher concentrates, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, as in, and, we, and, and in doing that, Mr. Chair, in, in, in using the best practice approach towards our medical marijuana program, you know, really helping our entrepreneurs. And that's something that we're, that our state is lacking, Mr. Chair, is it's, it's developing that foundation of a entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial spirit within this program to be able to advance it. And uh, it's not a question that the secretary should, you know, that I'm not asking her to, to answer what I've addressed, it's just that we need to have a best practice approach towards our program that entails, Mr. Chair, you know, uh, the opportunity to allow entrepreneurs to take risks and advance the product, advance the delivery system, uh, uh, and, uh, and have the department in the state be understanding of that and what that means in the concrete of allowing these growers, these producers, they want to make the investment, you know, that leeway, that availability to kind of move, move the initiative forward. So, um, you know, Mr. Chair, the, the Secretary uh, is more than um, welcome to address the concerns that I've shared with her, um, but she doesn't necessarily have to answer that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Did you want to respond to that, sir? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'd be happy to, to respond. Um, I, too, have spent time in China, and I, I think that Chinese herbs and medicine do have dosing requirements. Um, in New Mexico and in the, the nation, in the United States, you know, in New Mexico in particular, the patients should be working with their practitioner and either their producer or, or professional or someone to help them identify the appropriate dosage and strength and kind of cannabis that is effective upon their particular qualifying condition. I am absolutely committed to working on best practice initiatives for this program. This is Secretary um, Lynn Gallagher. And we have, we have improvements. I really want to work with patients. I want to talk to patients and find out what it is that, that I can do um, in my time here to make this program better for them. Because I, I have friends, I have family members 
who received great benefit and pain relief. I have a friend who suffers from terrible PTSD as a result of a very tumultuous situation, and I see that she is able to work and get relief and sleep at night, and that's, that's a benefit for me. But the dosage that she requires may not be the same kind of dosage that you, oh, Mr. Representative, would require for your condition. And so, further to that, nationally, the FDA sets dosing requirements for herbal supplements, etc. I'm really, really excited, um, partly, uh, not excited, but really excited that the DEA has expanded the ability to do research related to cannabis. I think that that is an important step from the federal government. I wish the Obama administration had chosen to do something differently on the other side, but they didn't. It's still a Schedule I um, drug, but they've expanded the opportunity for research and some of that may affect the dosage requirements for this, um, this medicine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, quick question for you. Is, is Mr. DeGill here today? Oh, good. So you're, you're getting, getting the full, and he will now be the head of the, of the program. So patients who are here, and uh, he heard the, the call for a, a, a patient, the regular contacts with the patient. So it's great that you're here. Thank you. Good luck with your job. And Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, may I address that? We really do encourage that. It's also a slippery slope because like Colorado and other states, patient information is confidential, and so they have to give us their approval to meet, and they have to, it has to come from them. They have to be willing to waive their confidentiality rights in order to be part of these groups. And so while we absolutely encourage it, it's all we also want to... 100% maintain their confidentiality. Now, let's see, we have Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will um, ask, and I will ask two questions in, in my uh, I will start with the Senate Cabinet Secretary. Yes. Um, tell me how you notified the patients of your decision to, to grant the extension of 60 days. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, so a couple of, of a couple of ways. So most of the patients that we deal with don't have email, and because of the confidentiality piece, we have been told that some of the, that information would be violative of that requirement. And so we reached out to the, the um, licensed nonprofit producers and gave them information, and also immediate, well, first and foremost, we posted it on our website and then made it available to all licensed nonprofit producers who have the database and have better abilities to get that email information out to their patients. It's not a perfect system, but we, rather than, than taking and sitting and generating mass mailings as well, we're trying to work on a better component to message that information, but to get it out as quickly as possible, putting it on the website, and getting the information to the licensed nonprofit producers has proven to be effective for the norm, for the not norm, for the majority. Okay. Thank you for, for trying in the way you did that. Surely it is a very serious thing when you when we know that patients have been waiting for so long, especially being ill. And, and for example, I keep in mind the lady who returned to appear before us with the seizures last time, who um, had been seizure free for two years, but couldn't get her car renewed because of the delay. And so it's those things that stay in my mind here. I, I guess I just um, um, had hope that there's a better way to notify patients immediately to know that they can access this medication in the future. But that being said, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just, uh, my next point is really not going to be a question. Um, I, I respect the fact that we're running out of time and so on, but I do want to make a, a, a statement here, uh, Cabinet Secretary. One is, number one, is that we know that from what we've heard today, we've heard in the last committee meeting, what we hear from patients directly and our constituents, that there is great demand out there for the medical cannabis. There are people who are clearly in need of benefiting from medical cannabis. And 
we have enough data to show it by now that it is something that is working. And so it seems to me that we have the two very important factors here to determine and make some decisions that we need to lift any, any restrictions on um, uh, any form that exists to allow patients to continue to get medical cannabis according to their needs. And you mentioned it yourself, Kevin Secretary, that not everyone has the same <coughs> one maybe one dose, different type, whatever it may be. So clearly it's been stated that not one size doesn't fit all. And because of that, we need to remove these limitations. Yes. Because that is where we're going to see patients get what they truly need. This program was, in fact, intended to help patients medically. And because we have the ability to remove any restrictions, both at a legislative level and you as an administrative level, we truly need to think seriously about doing that. Um, I, uh, I wanted to just briefly, Mr. Chairman, mention um, that, okay, just quickly, to add to that, because of the influx of new growth and patients coming into the system, and that's one of the things you can tell that it's, there's a great need out there. I really do not like to see reversions back of the funds that we appropriate, reversions back to the general fund. The need is so great out there that every dollar of every penny for someone ill should be used to help that patient. And so even if it was only 5,000, and whatever it may be, it was still something patients could use. So um, I just appreciate you continuing to work more. And I want to thank you for extending the, to, uh, extending the time frame for 60 days uh, for them. There was a concern that was expressed, and I'm a little bit confused now. Somebody mentioned, oh, but that doesn't help, the lady who spoke first out here, uh, said that it doesn't help patients that have 90 day delay. Sorry, it doesn't help with new people. So, so what what are you going to do about that? If, if by some chance you get delayed again and it goes on to 90 days, can you tell me? So, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we're we're looking at the application process and how we're processing new applications and renewal applications in light of this temporary um, automatic extension. And so, we are going to look at the processing of applications first to get them going, knowing that we, and we're also adding new people. So we're, we're increasing capacity in the system. All right, my two points are, thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Madam Secretary. I want to thank the, the other panelists who have spoken today, the patients primarily, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's about the patients, and thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Senator Brent, we never did give you a chance to introduce yourself, so if you want to introduce yourself, I don't know. And those that don't well, deal with me afterwards, and those that don't know each other. Now, I represent the uh, Senate District 40 Rear Rancho, and uh, I have more of a request than a, than a question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I always tell people that uh, I was against medical marijuana until I was a chronic pain patient. So, and I still never tried it, but I understand the, the uh, once you're, you're a chronic pain patient, you are almost willing to do anything to get a little bit of relief. Um, and uh, I have a kind of neurostimulator that allows me to walk. And otherwise, I would be in here in a wheelchair. And so, so I, I feel your pain, literally. Um, and so I understand this, uh, the issue, uh, because I'm through the, the VA, I have never tried it. I know they're relaxing those rules, but I don't trust the government um, to not turn around and, and get rid of all my benefits because I tried it. So anyway, my uh, request, I don't know if it would be the secretary or our staff, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I would really like a list of what is required by law you know, the law that was passed before I was in the legislature and what's actually being required by the rule. Because I think that that really confuses me as to, okay, so um, the, on the first part of slide nine, it says uh, tripling the, the plant count. 
for non-profit producers. Is the non-profit producers part required by law or the non-profit producers? And is the plant count required by law or is that rule? So I think it would really be helpful to me, um, as someone that wasn't around when this was passed, to know what's required in law and what's required by rule. Um, because if it's required in law, it's our fault. Um, if it's required in the rule and we disagree with it, then we can change the law um, to, to control a little bit tighter. So I don't know which is which, but that would be really helpful for, for me to have I think that's that an, excellent, an excellent idea. And maybe, maybe Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we're happy to provide that. Senator Brett, sorry, we're happy to You know, and our secretary, if you could give it to uh, uh, Sean, and then she'll make it a little for the whole committee. I think that would be really useful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all. Right. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Madam Secretary. This is your in the perfect place. Um, based on several other preceding questions, one of the concerns I had was was the issue of uh, what is regulatory and what is statute, and and the conflicts that are occurring because of that. I I read recently that that. I think the, the doctor that oversees um, the patient referrals um, had made the decision that the patient needed to go back and try other options for for uh, medical use rather than the cannabis that his original doctor had prescribed, and it became a digest in some capacity. And I was wondering what, what gives that doctor the, the permission to change the, the patient's physician's uh, directive or order. I was concerned about that because there are other issues regard, regarding the issue of regulation and statute. And then the second question to that is, uh, is uh, do you have a committee that helps you create regulation and on to Senator Brown's issue, what, what are we doing that we need to, what do we need to do to tighten up statute so that it's not conflicting with <coughs> regulation? Because sometimes I think it's arbitrary, but I don't want to provide it to the town. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the, um, so you were addressing something that was identified in rule, which was removed when we changed the rules recently. So there was a requirement that a physician that a physician had to provide an attestation that they tried other remedies first, and so that was removed. Um, and so that's and clear. You don't have to deal with that again anymore. I just give the chair. Chairman, was the committee correct? Yeah, and, and, then, and then the second one was the issue of the conflicting regs and statutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, as far as the rules and regs being conflicting, I would say that they don't conflict. The statute puts forth the lawful requirements. The rules put forth the lawful way those requirements will be met. And, and based on that, Mr. Chairman and, and Secretary, um, is there a committee that works with you to help create those regs? Because sometimes those regs, as I said earlier, seem very, I don't know if capricious, but definitely arbitrary and make it more difficult for the, for the patient to access their rights. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, so administrative law dictates how rules are promulgated in New Mexico, and typically there are, we have a medical cannabis advisory board that can advise us related to certain uh, pieces of the law. Um, a lot of other things come out of recommendations. We, we get recommendations all the time from producers, um, and they have the public patients. Others bring things to the department's attention. The survey that was done in 2013 prompted the, the agency at that time to look at the access and availability to, to medicine. And so many factors lead into creating and or amending rules. Then the public in general, advocates, any members of the public have a right to go before the public hearing and then to present written and or oral comments 
regarding those rules. Sometimes, many people, over a thousand people usually come to a medical cannabis rule promulgation and present it. <coughs> some people don't come. Some people seek that outside of the department and want special treatment. What happens then is that you sometimes have rules that get promulgated without their public input being entered into that. Um, and so it's always in this um, rotation of a manner, but the rules get promulgated based on public comment. And many times the department has to weigh, we have to weigh all of the, if you look at the page of all of the people that are our partners, when, when an issue comes up, the patients, they are first, we read their, their recommendations and we listen to them very, very seriously. We have patient advocates who come in and say, our patients are saying this. We have other, we have producers who come in and say, we want this. We have general public saying, we don't want this. And so you have a large number of public tax-paying citizens who are affecting the way these rules get promulgated. And, and let, let, let me just jump in because the question you just asked is one of the Jason Barker's paper, and I just want to read his paper. He says
And, and by the way, other states also, like Colorado and Oregon, also have those same numbers when you're paying low as a percentage of income they have. So with that aside, do you have capabilities with your current employees and, and budget to create um, new cards and renewals within the 30-day limit? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, yes. So when do you expect that to happen, that all cards and renewals will be done within the 30 days? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we are processing applications right now within the 30-day limit with the five-day mailing period. Um, we, over the last two weeks, we added some additional temporary staff to get up to speed um, in that regard as well. And we are bringing on some new employees into the program, permanent employees, and are looking to expand that even further. Okay, thank you. Um, I know many, many patients disagree with that. They still feel that there's a delay. Um, the committee has talked on other occasions of having a new bill to amend the old bill. So I wanted to ask you, would you support going to a Colorado system of, um, of registering online with forms? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we're, we're looking at um, online process improvements already. We're, we're looking into that right now. And will you have your decision before uh, December when we have to create legislation that this committee could either accept or reject? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm unclear of your question. Are you asking if we will be presenting legislation? No, oh. if you will have, you said you were looking at it, but will you know by December so that this committee can work with you as to whether or not you can accept, um, we can work together to create a bill in that arena that we can both agree on? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I, as agency head, will administer any law that the legislature passes. Um, we are working on the online improvements, and my goal would be that we will have that plan in place, maybe not the exact online processing. There are quite a few things that have to go into that. In addition, we have to create an online electronic records retention plan through the records and archives. And so that plan will be developed right then. Well, we can put that in state. If we put it in statute, in something we can all agree on, we could do a delayed implementation date to, instead of July of next year, maybe December of next year, if you need more time. But what I'm trying to do is something collaboratively with you, so that we're not fighting with each other about trying to get an online system that I think we could all agree would work, both for the doctors and the patients, let alone the department. So, um, I'd like you to consider having something by December so we can all work collaboratively. Number two, um, would you um, um, consider, are you considering increasing the five to the regional average of about five ounces or more for each patient? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, at, the, at this current date, the department <coughs> does not have a plan to open the rules. Um, we are looking at those system improvements to see what we are going to do next. Again, um, there is a lot of numbers flying around, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I have not received any um, evidence-based data that, that presents that to us, and I'm happy to work collaboratively with anyone who wants to do that. Okay, because the, I think this is where the rule is in conflict with the statute. The statute said there should be an adequate supply. And you saw how high the limit was of two ounces a day in Colorado. You just heard that today, the testimony from Colorado. And the other states have it at five ounces. It would seem to me that we should be at least at five. And quite frankly, when I was dealing with the department, and you weren't the, the chair there, I know, but I, I didn't see any medical reason for setting it at where we set, set it now. So I think when you're in conflict with the statute, the burden is on the department to show that, that this is a rational number that would be that most supply. So uh, I hope you'll look at that and we can talk about that before December. Would you, uh, are you considering removing the concentration of THC limits at 
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the department has no um, plans at the present moment to open the rules. Okay, because um, I think these are the things that we've talked about when we need the statute. And I think, quite frankly, the statute in these two particular areas are in conflict with the rules, and I think the statute should always. And we don't want the department to be open to lawsuits. Um, Will you consider, and are you actively considering um, a, uh, a system where, at least for chronic patients, that you'll open up um, having the cards good for more than one year? Again, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we're not in the process right now of opening the rules. However, we have embarked on conversations and discussions on how do we approach the process improvements to meet the needs, the best needs of the patient. I understand, but if we change the statute, these rules will not be worth it. But we don't want to change the statute in an adverse way. So what I'm getting at is, would you oppose a change in the statute that affects these rules that are not as the Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it depends. Like with, with a prescription medication, you have to get it renewed every year. And you have to go back to your doctor and have your antibiotic or your blood pressure medicine or your pain medicine renewed every year. I, I don't know of a, of a prescription medication that is um, unlimited in its nature that's not over the counter. And so therefore, I would just like to stress that we are the regulatory body of this program and the federal government has just come down and said that the Department of Justice reserves the right to step into a state that does not regulate its program. I'm not saying in any regard that I'm not in favor of looking at it, but it is, for the state of New Mexico, a slippery slope to consider it. Okay. I have one other question. This would be an easy yes or no, same kind of thing. Do you oppose, or does the department oppose, presumptive eligibility for new applicants and for those that have completed a, 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 made a complete application, especially if you get one more? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that is one of the things that we're looking at. Thank, thank you, Senator. Senator Representative Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Secretary, for being here, and I appreciate your uh, for the renewals, I know, and I'm reading the statute, I have the statute right here, and almost everything we've talked about today is in rules, it's not in the statute. One thing that is in the statute is the one year expiration, so I appreciate that um, that you've done that, but what's not in rules is what it requires for reapplying. So that can be, um, uh, and, and you can issue, um, renew or issue um, again. So. Um, I won't um, state the same questions. I, I just would add to that list um, the plant count for producers. Because there's nothing in the statute that limits the amount that someone can have, the amount of licensed producers, the number of plants per producer that can be produced. None of that is in statute. It's all up to the department and rulemaking. And uh, so I would strongly encourage you to re, uh, to revisit all that if we don't um, change it legislatively um, and, and prompt that, um, and, as well as the um, percentage of THC. And I just want to make one other point about, particularly about the plant count. Uh, and, uh, and as we're seeing more and more uh, medical uh, cannabis programs across the country, more and more sophistication in producing uh, the uh, form and format in which uh, it's available, not just smoking, but in other kinds of um, uh, forms. And in order to get concentrated forms, I know we've all heard the stories about the kids with seizure disorders and needing the oil. Um, so it takes a lot more plant, a lot more plant. And so uh, by restricting the plant count, you're also restricting innovation 
and uh, development of new uh, treatment um, techniques, new treatment modalities of production of whether it's pills, suppositories, edibles, um, uh, not just smoking. And so uh, it just takes, if you're going to do that in more concentrated or other kinds of forms, it, it takes more plants. And so I would really uh, strongly encourage that being uh, lifted uh, as well, and, um, and there's the, uh, we all know the hearing process, the rule process is long, and it, it take, you can't do it um, most of that overnight. You could do an emergency rule um, a little faster. I would encourage you to consider that, um, um, but um, no time like the present to get started on these. Um, otherwise, I, I think we will see legislative. Um, response uh, to some of this. So um, I, I just would really encourage you to, to um, um, as you think over my mind, I'm trying to uh, improve your processes for applications, looking at presumptive eligibility, um, streamline renewal um, processes, particularly for chronic conditions would be um, uh, great. And um, the, the limitations in all ways, number of producers, number of plants, concentrations, um, uh, amount uh, that someone can possess, um, all should be uh, looked at and expanded. So thank you. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. And finally, Senator Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I appreciate you being here. It's not easy when people are uh, pointing very, very pointed fingers and things about a program, and you weren't here when lots of it was first set up. So thank you for being here and hopefully answering our questions. Uh, my question really is very similar to what others have, is much of what I think people are concerned about it has to do with rules that have been promulgated, not with the actual legislation. And so I guess I'm concerned the, and I think it's the 270 units. Where did that come from? Under what science? Where is that research that said that's the right number? So, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, you know, the process, so the process that we looked at, we looked at other states. Um, we also took into consideration that a larger number of the population wanted the cannabis-derived product rather than, than a smokable. And so we were trying to figure out a way that, and we worked with others in other states and in other areas to give us information on how could someone who was baking brownies or making lollipops, how could that equate to a gram rather than a gram is a gram is a gram. Does that answer the question? Mr. Chairman, no. And we, and we, well, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, in addition, we received a lot of public comment regarding how do you, how do you get at these levels, and there was a, a plethora of different ways to do it. So, I'm happy to go, go back and, I apologize, I'm happy to go back and get you some specific information that my, my brain is today. I can go back and look up the rule process for you. Yes, and I appreciate it. I would, would very much, much like to see what the public input was or what kinds of things that resulted in that particular process and that amount. And you indicated just now that we looked at other states on how to do that, yet the data we were presented with with other states have very, very different processes, and we heard testimony that we are the only state that uses a process like this. And is this scientifically research-based? Where did it come from? And, and I wasn't around then. I don't think you were around then. I would very much like to know, because I think this is something that we can easily fix as easily as it was first put in. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I just had one, one question of my own. And that has to do with uh, biotrack. <laughs> Senator Ortiz Pena. role in this whole thing, and how did they get into the middle of it? How are they in the position of saying to somebody, you've exceeded the suggested amount and, and all of this stuff? How are they in the middle of this? Who are they and what are they doing to us? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, Biotrack is a seed to sale program. Like many others, you'll hear MJ Freeway is another one that's very popular um, in the area. And what it does 
is it tracks your um, seed through sale. The department put out an RFP and BioTrack won that award. They're on a contract right now. Um, and what they do is they work with the producers to track their medicine and make sure that we have information on what they're growing, how much they're growing, and who they're selling it to. And the patient's um, information is fed into that software system. And so if they go over their their 90-day limit, it will tell them that. We encourage patients to contact us if they're having issues, and I'm happy to make that part of our, our discussion if they're having issues with BioTrack. We want them to be successful, but I also realize that they're a, they're a contractor. I want them to be successful, um, and I will say that. It, it didn't, I wish I had asked this question of Colorado. It didn't sound like Colorado had any such they have the seed to sale system, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I just don't know what they what they use, who they use. And was BioTrack the, the ones that came up with this unit? The, the, the unit? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I don't believe so. I'm going to research that information. Very <coughs> good point. Exactly. Very good point. Exactly. A biocrat, please check into this. They really should have, they don't have any authority, they should not Senator have to make decisions on behalf of anyone, the patient, the state, the Department of Health, or anyone. They're a data tracking system, obviously, and that should be uh, the scope of their board position. The state did. I just want to make that clear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, now thank you. We're just, we're just, well, we should have made a three day hearing on the <laughs> It's too much fun games, so thank you, Madam Secretary. But we're now going to turn to public comment. And I assume that a large amount of this, and we're going to, just because of timing, we're going to limit you to two minutes. Uh, I am uh, asking uh, John to use the timer here. It will uh, ring a bell, and a code of, code of silence will descend from the ceiling. So first, let's see, we have uh, how many people? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight people have signed up. Maybe more. We have another list. That's it. Eight people have signed up. So actually, we could give you each uh, two minutes, and assuming you fudge a little bit, uh, we'll get out of here by six o'clock. Um, Missy Wallace. Well, that's the morning comment. She said that. Yeah, I'm glad I could run on this. Well, oh, I see. This is page one. I reversed the page. Sorry. Brian Cox, is he here? Yep. All right, Brian Cox. First of all, I want to appreciate uh, the committee, the chairman, and the members to allow us to speak and uh, get a word in because uh, the Department of Health does not seem to actually listen to any of the patients at all. I can answer some of the questions, especially about the the drug manufacturer stuff. Um, but I have one real concern here, and there's a lot of violations going on there. I've got something, and I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to get into why I feel that there's uh, a number of HIPAA violations, not only with Colorado, but mainly right here, that's going on. And that's in the privacy of all of our information, the training of these people, you bring in temporary people, They've got access to all of our information. That's against HIPAA violation, a laws. That's a violation. And I take it very serious because of two things. Number one, I do HIPAA audits on companies that have violated the HIPAA laws. I've been doing it for five years, and I'll keep doing it. One of the other problems is, is I'm ready to file a lawsuit against one of the major men, uh, drug uh, 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 no, medical uh, facilities out here for violating HIPAA laws. People in New Mexico don't seem to keep their mouth shut. And that's a real problem when it's violating our information out to the, uh, the public. And with some of this bio track thing, that's against the HIPAA laws as well. They have a problem. They have a problem in five states that I know of 
that's had the same issues with these cards. Check it out. My name is Brian Cox. I've been on the medical cannabis program for five years following four years of medical malpractice and diagnosis in which I was put on uh, pharmaceutical drugs that nearly killed me more than once. Uh, I won't go through the nightmare I have been through, but I can tell you there are good things that are coming out of this program. I can tell you that I also sh suffer from a condition that's called Cushing syndrome. It's actually what I have is Cushing's disease. It's a rare medical condition. One thing I can address about conditions is that most people that have an autoimmune condition usually have seven to ten different issues going on at the same time. Documented. The problem is, is that the people that are sitting here making decisions on our, on our efforts, supposedly, to help us get medical uh, treatments, half of them don't even have a medical background to stand there. I can run circles. If there's any doctors in here, I'll be glad to sit and, and discuss things about autoimmune conditions. My, my one condition with the Cushing's, there is no doctor in the state of New Mexico that deals with Cushing's disease. And like I said, typically there's two ways of somebody getting Cushing's. One is the disease, one is the syndrome. The syndrome is typically from high cortisol levels. And it's usually from adrenal, a, a tumor on the adrenal gland. The condition that I have is not that. I've talked to the only doctor in this state that deals with adrenal tumors. Mine is pituitary. It's a rare condition. Now, we can go through the, the circle jerk of, of what's going on. You try to try to well, you know, we sat here, we were told we were going to be speaking at 3 o'clock. This is public comment, Brian. We try to limit it to three minutes. You've now gone five, so if you could try to move along. All right, number one. What the State Department is doing with the DOH is a joke. They're sitting there telling us what kind of medicine we're supposed to have, what kind of, uh, how much we're supposed to have. That right there is a violation of HIPAA. And if you don't believe me, I've got plenty of stuff sitting down there. And now, not to make a threat, but right now, I have a major lawsuit against a drug manufacturer of one of these things that they near killed me, and more than once. I take this very serious, especially someone's trying to kill me. I take it very serious. Now, some people can sit there and play games and make excuses. I don't play them. I do my homework. My medical records are up right now at an at attorney's office. Four inch binder and three two inch binders. That's my medical records. And to sit there and have somebody sit there and tell me what I can take and how much is a joke. Right there, you see that big toe? In, in April I was up at Mayo Clinic. I had an MRI done and I had some other stuff done. Due to the fact that this cortisol has destroyed my bones and my muscles, I've lost 60 pounds because of this dang condition. You know what? No one here seems to care when you go talking to 10 endocrinologists in this state, and none of them can diagnose it. They're sitting there willing to put you on these <coughs> pharmaceutical drugs and then send you down the road we'll see you in six months. That's a joke. Thank you, Brian, for, for, for your testimony. I'm sorry. The, the thing is this. Once I get done with that lawsuit with the drug manufacturer, if this thing doesn't get taken care of, I'm coming after the state. That's a promise. That's not a threat. We're tired of playing the games with this DOH, the bozos that are running it, and it's all worth Money to them is all it seems to be. They don't care about our health. And I wish I had a lot more time, but you 
will be hearing about it more. Where is it? Scott Fleetwood. 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 I pretty much forgot what I was going to say. I've been sitting here so long, or what I wanted to say. Uh, I've been, I'm one of the first 3,800 people that we're talking about on the program here in Mexico. Uh, I currently have on PTSD better. Don't deal with the VA. The VA's never done nothing for me or my friends before. Uh, I've got up 79. PTSD is hell. Uh, I have no health, mental health care here in the house. Our health care got blown out of water about two years ago. I have no health care. I'm a child called child member. I go to health care on the Indian Pueblo. I've just pretty much been running out of my Indian health care. And by certain generals, three of them surrounded me in an office here recently, in a house photo, and uh, kind of ganged up on and run out of my health care. And I've had to make them make copies of my medical marijuana card, which was hell, it's a nightmare. It's been a nightmare dealing with the medical marijuana situation here in New Mexico. A nightmare. I'm a legal grower. My cards, even though they were paid for my 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 psychiatrist and stuff, all my paperwork was in. I never got my last card renewed. They owe me $35 straight up ripped me off. I live 80, uh, it's an 80 mile round trip from where I live here to Taos just to buy gas, just to buy food. I live off the grid. And uh, you know, they're not renewing their cards like they say 60 days. Oh, that's bullshit, straight up bullshit. My card is a year and a half out of date. There's no sight. When I'm going to get my card, guess what? I just quit two prescriptions of oxycodone on myself. No, no help. There's no help in Dallas County if you want to quit. I was taking 180 oxycodones a month. Two different, two different prescriptions of. I wean myself off. Now all I have is medical marijuana. I have Medicaid. I've been through all the Medicaid doctors here in Dallas. I have no help there. And then you know. It's just ridiculous that they sit here and say, oh, we got 60 days to keep your car. BS. BS. I have a dozen friends here that are out of the program, all veterans, that don't do what the VA, out of the program because it's too hard to get your car to renew. There was only one psychiatrist in all of New Mexico, all of Taos County, that would even write it. He's no longer here. We don't have mental health care here in Taos. None. I need it. I wanted it. I liked it. I was there 10 years. I have no health care. I don't have health care. I don't have Medicaid. I don't have any health care. Just run out of there. By certain generals getting up on me. And my medical marijuana use was pulled up against me. Just recently, here on Top Squadron. You know, I'm just disgusted with the medical marijuana program here. I think they should just disband it and start over again. Being one of the original people here, I can tell you it's boots on the ground that are going to tell you the truth. It's not all this bullshit. They're flying around right now in the air. It sounds great. It's bullshit. Straight up bullshit. And I'm tired and I'm going home to smoke a door. And you know what? I'm going home to smoke a Because my car is not being used. And I still got 16 plants growing. And that's all I have. I have no other medication. And I'm going home to come. My friend died from a Vietnam vet. Uh, his car ran out on him. He died of criminal here in New Mexico. And he was on the medical marijuana program. I'm on the program on the criminal. You know where I'm on all week? Colorado, just north of me. And the, the first time I ever bought from a dispensary here, oh, it was a nightmare. Almost got into a fight with the guy that owns it. He was so rude. And the weed sucked. It didn't have to do with sour. It tasted terrible. They had no clue, and it's bought almost $500 an ounce. I could pay $150 an ounce right here in Dallas County and get better product.
But he was giving her notes, telling her what to say the whole time. I don't know if we're allowed to ask for all of them. Well, that's, her, that's the attorney for the department. Wow. Well, she's here. The secretary's still here. Supposedly, she went to the bathroom. Some transparency. Um, well, it's probably Brown. So, you guys already heard me in Santa Fe. I'm not going to repeat what I said in Santa Fe about I'm held accountable for all my choices. I would hope that you guys will hold the Madam Secretary for DOH accountable for her choices or lack thereof. When we're listening to the plan that works in Colorado, that's great in Colorado, only 29% of their population is below the po federal poverty line. I looked this information up while we were in here waiting to be able to do our comments. 71% is well over 200% of the federal poverty line. Here in New Mexico, 41% below the federal poverty line. 60% of our children are well under the federal poverty line. So adding any fees to what we're already having to pay for $250 to see a doctor each year to get it renewed so the Department of Health can wait anywhere from 60 days to 90 days to 18 months. I know of three cancer patients who died before their cards were renewed. Am I angry? Yes. I stayed as calm as I could, but listening to her talk, I am just about done. In response to her request for evidence-based data on how to dose with medical cannabis, all she needs to do is read the papers that have been published in Canada regarding how much it takes milligrams of THCA per type of cancer. They have it. It's been published. I couldn't pull it up on my phone. The internet here is too slow. Um, regarding how many savings, I believe that was you, Senator Cisco Orley, correct? Yes, and he's sure. over, not here, there. You asked about the savings? Okay, there was a father-daughter team out of the University of Georgia. I can't pull out their names. The full text can be found in the Medical Affairs Journal from July 2016. That from 2010 to 2013, in the 15 states that were involved that over that time period, there were not 15 states at the beginning that had medical cannabis passed, they spent $165.2 million less in the year of 2013. That is only Medicare Part D. The estimation based on their data is if medical cannabis was made federal, it would save medical care part, uh, Medicare Part D over $470 million a year. The initial data has not yet been peer-reviewed and published, but it looks as if the savings from Medicaid would be much greater. For Madam Secretary for the Department of Health, um, Secretary Lynn Gallagher, she wanted other information about treatment and what dosages would take. Deepak D. Salza, he's a doctor, um, works with the Yale School of Medicine, so I'm assuming that we can all trust his knowledge. For the average patient, it's about $400 a month and a little over five ounces a month for the average patient to reach full treatment efficacy levels. Which is what those other states are, are, are doing. doing. Exactly. This is why Colorado chose to go with the two ounces a day, because for severe chronic pain, management like you, Mr. Brandt, like myself, like my mother-in-law, it can take well in excess of that. Currently, I have found best dosing to be, it's basically a syringe. You just do out a teeny tiny amount, basically the size of a grain of rice. Um, there's, depending on which one you buy, you can get roughly about 20 doses out of that, that's $60. I stretch it out. I only use it on days like today. Most of the time I stay home. I'm living off of SSI. I only get $730 a month. I already had to come up with the $250 to pay the doctor so that I could go in because it's no longer covered in a regular in-office visit by my Medicaid insurance like it was in 2010. So I have to pay cash out of pocket to go see a doctor that I normally see anyway to help me manage my medication because it's no longer paid for by Medicaid. Then we get to wait for the 30 to 60, oh, I'm sorry, 90 days 
before you get your card that's post dated to 30 days after you submitted your application, but you don't get the card until two months later. And it expires in April of next year. So I will have my card for 10 months, eight months before I have to start the recertification process. Now, I was taking very, very quick notes. You guys were asking, so far at this point in time, when they did that Medicare Part D, the only thing that they were studying was anxiety meds, depression medications, glaucoma, nausea, and pain meds. When I started this program, when I left Washington State, I was on over a dozen medications to treat my PTSD and what we've now finally discovered this year that I also had fibromyalgia. One of those medications was over $1,200 a month. Combined, Medicaid was spending $3,600 a month on my medications. At this point in time, they only have to cover a $30 prescription of Prazosin every month for me because the medical cannabis has replaced everything else I have to take. <laughs>
doing no work. I received my medical exemption, exception, excuse me, after a couple of years. I'm also PPL holder. I produce my own medicine. I'm going to need more plants. This isn't laid up for in rules. I, I'm going to need an, a higher count, a higher plant count. My fact, uh, provider has decided that I break the medical exception. I'm just very all of all the issues. My back, my toe hurts, my ankle hurts, my amygdala and my hippocampus are in a positive feedback situation that institutes quite right. All at once, right now, all at once. I'm not sure I'm going to manage extra time for my PPL is going to be a very soon process or maybe hearing from me about it. I, I, right now the, the rules don't allow for more plants for the right now. Maybe I need help. Maybe I need to ask a producer out here to partner up with me and to help me grow these different varieties. I'm not really sure where we're going with this and you last for two minutes. You got it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. floating around patients groups that were obtained from Ken Grogo asking um, for Jeremy, I believe, with page analytics on his uh, advice on the 70% cap and from the documentation that we have, that's where the cap came from. Um, I also strongly believe with our numbers growing, the patients are getting organized. There's a lot of different patient groups. There's uh, New Mexico Cannabis Moms Group. There's um, the LUCA group, um, I'm with New Mexico Impact, the New Mexico Patients Alliance, and I think this is the, these, this is our program, this is the beef of our program, and these are the people that we do need to um, coincide with, collaborate with, and network with to get a full uh, synopsis of what's actually happening within the program. I believe that a lot of um, reports that are coming from the Department of Health are one-sided. And I think that with the patients numbers growing and with a lot of attention and support from you guys, um, a lot of their shortcomings are going to be out of outed and they have to be rectified. And I wish they were here. If they are not willing to fix this, they really need to look at themselves and step aside and let someone else come in to fill that position. Uh, we don't have the experts in New Mexico. We need to outsource and bring someone in to train our producers or to train our inspectors to see who's regulating um, what the patients need as far as pesticides, as far as labeling, as far as the increase. Um, one big thing is biotrap. Um, even the most, um, even, even the producers that are our leaders and stand out amongst the other producers are having problems with this. So it's not something that everybody's just jumping on the bandwagon to complain about. Um, as far as the units goes, patients are going uh, from one dispensary, completely cut off, but walking into a dispensary and having their units. There's no regulation there. There's nothing that are, that's helping the patients there. Um, and then as far as the, uh, as far as the dosing, dispensaries currently are providing a roundabout educating of the dosing already, whether it's right or wrong. Like um, Senator Rodriguez said, you know, not everything does fit in a one size fit all, fits all packet. Um, but I will, again, keep it short and sweet. And thank you again for your time. And we really appreciate you um, within the New Mexico uh, Medical Cannabis Program. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys 
for, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I kind of just want to like wrap it all up. You know, this is this is something that we've all been dealing with. Um, personally, myself, I'm actually vice president for the New Mexico Cannabis Patients Alliance. Um, also, a consultant for LMPPs and patients for their <coughs> cultural needs. Um, so, I interact with patients on a pretty regular basis. And I interact with P uh, LMPPs on a pretty regular basis. And the fact that we can all stand together, maybe separately because we don't really understand each other, and can say the same things, means there are definite issues. And you guys can see it over the past few days, um, over today, and over the, the conversations that we've been having. So uh, again, thank you guys for your time. Thank you guys for coming here and, and acknowledging the, 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 the issues that patients have been having, acknowledging their their pain and their suffering that they've been enduring for this and realize that 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 it needs to start with them because there's too many I mean I spoke with I spoke with the producer this morning or yesterday yesterday afternoon uh, I spoke with the manager at Pure Life um, which is owned by Darren White <clears throat> uh, and his vision his views on the whole situation is him being new they had just recently opened up a few months ago and that in that few months they they have run into issues being so fresh. They have three patients that currently have reached their limit and have continued to have their limit reached for the past three months and it hasn't changed. They would come in the next day and that, that they were supposed to be refilled and it never gets refilled. So I mean, there's just issues in the program in the, it, in the actual way it works. So um, I just wanna thank you guys for coming in. I'll cut it short. Um, there's, there's just a lot of pain being had and it needs to change. And I hope that you guys can help us do that. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the last two that we have on the list are Missy Wallace. Is she here? I don't believe she is. Okay, then we have uh, Tulima Malaga. Mr. Chair, hello committee members. Um, last time in Santa Fe, I was written down to speak and I was too nervous. I didn't medicate that day. Uh, same thing today. I won't go into the crazy stuff you guys have already heard, a lot of the numbers, a lot of the rules, everything's above my head these days. It's kind of ironic that we're here in Chas and I'm gonna keep it short and simple, but it's something I need you guys to consider. You know, we talk about patience and it becomes very generic thing. One of us comes up here and tells our story. You guys will remember it for five minutes. But the thing, the thing about being in Taos for me, and why it's just such an irony, is because three years ago, I was a completely different person. At that time, I was a qualifying broker for a huge boutique uh, property management firm out of Santa Fe. I was making a meager amount of money, you know, only 40000 a year. I oversaw over 150 properties with individual owners. I had to help reconcile trust accounts on a regular basis. If anybody wanted to ever look up my license, they could online and saw that I was in good standing. Obviously, I couldn't be dim to do that job. Today, you wouldn't consider me overly dim, but I'm definitely incapacitated compared to what I was. Another reason why it's so funny is because I was also the same person at that time as part of Rotary. I was putting in, you know, like, it was, like we were saying, with salaries, you know, it's not nine to five. You're putting in 60, 80 hour weeks. I'm sure a lot of you up there know exactly what this feels like. I was also a vice president for the Chamber of Commerce up in Angel Fire. And I was also a voting, uh, a voting member for the Taos Entrepreneurial Network. I did a lot of those jobs. And uh, what I didn't know at the time was there was my own alphabet soup starting to go on. You guys talk about all these committees. Uh, things like BioTrack and all these letters that's supposed to represent these abstract ideas. Well, the letters I get to deal with are PTSD, Hashimoto's, ME, that's my logic encephalus encephalomyelitis. I can't even say it right, but I know I got it. I have chronic fatigue syndrome. I have IBSD, so that means I got to be kept from not to eat these seats before I leave. The reason why I can handle some of this on a daily basis now and this is something you guys have well overheard, is because of cannabis. I don't have to take 12 different medications. I don't have to be hooked on opioids like my mom did and almost die from a nervous, 
a nervous attack at 40, having a heart attack. I'm 40 right now. I've had my nervous breakdown, you know, but at least with cannabis, there's a future for me. I know you understand how important this is, but I want you to see my face when you think about these things. I just had a reaction over a new pill they just tried on me over this weekend. It's called Lamactol. I don't know if you've heard about the black box warning, but you can get a necrotic rash. I started itching about six weeks in. If it worked for cannabis this weekend, who knows what that would have been? Have you heard of Zoloft? Have you heard of serotonin syndrome? I have. I don't even have the same vocabulary I used to have three years ago. Your brain overheats. I've lost 17 hours of my life sitting there drooling like I've never even heard a word that made any sense to anybody. Because of cannabis, at least I can talk to you today. Where's the secretary that said that she was going to be here to hear what I had to say? Yeah. <laughs> at least you're here. New Mexico may not be number one in a lot of things. Why don't we think about being number one about this? Thank you. classification vote, office schedule one, if that's declassified, all the research that can go forward across the country and the world on this medical cannabis. And let me tell you, this, this program has helped me. I've had five surgeries this year, and uh, I'm, I'm scheduled for one more, and, and I'm hoping that uh, once that last one's done, I'll be pain free. I won't need to keep medical cannabis. For the record, Mr. Chairman, um, medical cannabis is off schedule one in New Mexico. But we can't vote on the federal. Right? We excluded cannabis in the bill when we banned it. So in New Mexico, it's not a schedule one. But we're still going on the federal. Well, the DOJ did announce this week that in states that legalize medical cannabis, you cannot arrest or prosecute, which means our police department, especially in Albuquerque Police Department, is violating federal statute at this point in time. Well, so according to Dark, so is the town's police department there, but I don't understand why they didn't even bother. Well, members, um, two things. There are minutes in, the, in your packet. I, I'd ask you to read them over. Uh, we meet back here at 8 30. And don't forget, dinner now uh, will be at the uh, Old Martinez Hall. We got the menus. I'm going to 
I've got one thing to say. You want to know what high cortisol level is like? The doctors have told me I run on 100 miles an hour at my rest. When it's triggered, it hits 200 miles an hour. You want to know what it feels like? That's a test. Okay, that seems to be the uh, the end of the meeting. Thank you for listening to uh, our live feed. Sorry for any problems that you might have had. This is Medical Marijuana Radio saying good